Welcome to UC Berkeley Center for Studies in Higher Education Roundtable Discussion Is There Academic Freedom in an Online World? I'm Robert May, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy and Linguistics at the University of California, Davis, and Faculty Associate at CSHE. I will be moderating today's discussion. Traditionally, academic events, including classes, lectures, symposia, conferences, colloquia, and the like, have been held in brick and mortar university venues. But during the past year and a quarter, these academic events have by necessity shifted to online platforms like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and FaceTime. But while we are now moving back to campus life, online events will remain a permanent and ubiquitous part of the academic calendar. There is much to celebrate about this. It will for certain enhance the ability of scholars and researchers from around the globe to participate more easily and regularly with colleagues and students like for the presentation of scholarship and research to a vastly broader audience. The utilization of online platforms requires us, however, to face issues of academic values in new and to a large extent uncharted waters. When academic events are held in university venues, their conduct is governed by university policies, most notably and of present concern policies on academic freedom, particularly as they pertain to freedom of expression in academic settings. But with the shift to online platforms, this is no longer the case. Universities are sponsoring events that are hosted on platforms they do not own. Does academic freedom retain the same meaning, offer the same protections in these online contexts, or is it compromised in some way by the legal or commercial interests of the hosting platforms? To discuss these matters, I'm pleased to welcome our panelists. Kay Klonick is Assistant Professor of Law at St. John's University. Professor Klonick has published widely both scholarly and popular media on network technologies effect on social norm enforcement, freedom of expression and private governance. Sean Malloy is president, professor of history and critical race and ethnic studies at the University of California, Merced. Professor Malloy has been involved in leadership for the UC Academic Center for many years and was an organizer of an online symposium that stimulated today's discussion Josh Parecki is Head of Trust and Safety and Senior Corporate Counsel for Zoom, where he has been involved in developing Zoom's position on academic freedom. Robert Post is Sterling Professor of Law at the Yale School of Law. He's one of the country's leading scholars of academic freedom and a member of the AAUP's Committee A. Professor Post was the architect of the University of California's academic freedom policy when he was a faculty member at the UC Berkeley School of Law. Brian Suchek is Professor of Law and Chancellor's Fellow at the University of California, Davis. He's a Fellow of UC's National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement, and is currently the Chair of the UC Academic Center's Committee on Academic Freedom. Our format today will be a roundtable discussion among the panelists. If you have questions, please ask them using the live chat, and I will bring them to the attention of the panelists as appropriate. We'll have an additional half hour Q&A session at the end of the discussion, during which you can address directly to the panelists. The proximate stimulus for the event today was a denial of service by Zoom for a symposium entitled, Whose Narrative? What Free Speech for Palestine? Organized by Professor Malloy, along with Professors Rabab Abdul Hadi and Tomomi Kinukawa of Cal, Cal State San Francisco, with the consent of UC Merced. This followed a denial of service for a previous symposium sponsored by Cal State San Francisco. The cause of the denials was the anticipated participation of Leila Khaled, who was a member of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a group that is on the US State Department list of terrorist organizations. Such speakers, according to Zoom, violate their terms of service. Professor Malloy, could you give us your perspective on what occurred and its implications? Then Mr. Parecki, could you comment on Zoom's position as well as on Zoom's corporate position on respecting academic freedom. After that, I invite our other participants to join the conversation. Sean? Thank you, Professor May, um, both for that introduction, uh, for hosting us today, and, and also to the Center for Studies in Higher Education. Um, and I think as you alluded to, um, there's a kind of larger context here that I think is worth briefly dipping back into to explain how we got to this point. Um, this didn't start with me. This started uh, back in September of 2020 uh, when a panel organized by Professors Kanakawa and Abdul Shadi at San Francisco State um, that was looking at issues like gender and resistance in Palestine. 
and featured not just Leila Khaled, but a kind of all-star cast of folks, including uh, Sekou Dingo, Laura Whitehorn, Ronnie Casserles, and Rula abdul Dahao, um, was scheduled to be presented on Zoom. Um, under pressure from Zionist groups, Facebook removed all the advertising for that event, uh, and both Zoom and YouTube declined to carry it in September of 2020. Now, in the aftermath of that cancellation, uh, the Council of UC Faculty Associations uh, wrote a, a letter to the new UC president, Michael Lee Drake, uh, and expressed some concerns about this, uh, because even though this was an event originally sponsored by San Francisco State, um, you know, all universities now uh, are, are in, in, in a place where we're highly reliant on services like Zoom. Um, the Faculty Association's got a response from uh, UC Provost Michael Brown, uh, in which the provost pledged that the UC would work very, very closely with Zoom and its faculty and the academic senate if something like this were ever to happen involving the university. Um, and that's where I entered the picture. Um, and I decided that I, I, I think it would be useful to put the UC to the test as well as put Zoom to the test on it. Uh, and so I reached out to the original, uh, the, the original folks who organized the panel at San Francisco State. Uh, and we put together a new panel that featured all of the original participants um, this time centered around the question of free speech, for, free speech and how it intersects specifically with Palestine. Um, we also got sponsorship from the Council of UC uh, Faculty Associations as well as the UC Humanities Research Institute. And the idea was to have a, a discussion centered um, not simply around the abstract questions of free speech or academic freedom, but really to, to center Palestine at the heart of that. Um, it was scheduled for April 23rd. Um, and relatively shortly after we announced it, a couple of things happened. First, Facebook um, not only removed all of the promotional materials for the event, uh, they also removed the entire page for the Arab and Muslim ethnicities and diasporas program in San Francisco State. Um, this is a page that had years of content of videos um, for both community and educational purposes, years of events were pulled, years of content was pulled down. Uh, Eventbrite, which we used to keep track of our participants, also took down uh, our event page. Um, and all this was theoretically under the rubric of community standards, right? That, that an event on free speech in Palestine featuring Leila Khaled would violate community standards. Uh, now we initially didn't hear anything from Zoom. And I think we were, we were you know, guardedly optimistic given that out of sheer coincidence, uh, and I assure, I assure Josh and everybody, this was a sheer coincidence that, that just, just shortly before we announced our event, uh, Facebook had announced this new set of policies on content moderation and academic freedom, which I know Josh and, and Brian will speak to. Uh, so we were cautiously optimistic that maybe this would go forward despite the actions of Facebook and event Uh Eventually, I was told by our campus council um, that UC Legal was sort of negotiating with Zoom Legal and that UC would be arguing for the event to go forward. Um, I wasn't privy to any of these negotiations. I was not in the room for any of these. Um, you know, the, the other folks here can maybe offer their perspective on what happened during the course of the negotiations. Uh, I was at one point asked by the UC folks, um, uh, by the UC legal folks indirectly, would I be willing to assume responsibility for shutting down our event if violence was discussed? Right. So suddenly, if somebody started talking about violence, would I take the responsibility for pulling the plug on our event? Um, and my reply to that was that if I had to shut down a Zoom session every time violence was mentioned, then the entire online version of my U.S. history survey course would have to be canceled and taken down. <laughs> um, so finally, on April 20th, three days before the event was scheduled to take place, I received my first and only communication from, um, from Zoom, and it came in the form of an email from the Zoom trust and safety team. Um, and this is quite brief, I'll just read that email and that'll sort of conclude my, my, my part of this and I'll turn it over to others. So the email I received said the following, earlier this month, Zoom was notified of an event you are hosting where Lela Khaled is scheduled to speak. Consistent with our policies, we consulted with the University of California and carefully considered the facts of the event in light of our academic freedom for our higher education users statement as well as our terms of service and community standards prior to making a determination about whether or not Ms. Khaled's participation would be in violation of our policies. Uh, for careful consideration, we recently informed the University of California that the event does in fact violate our policies and will not be allowed on Zoom if Ms. Khaled participates given her affiliation with a US designated foreign terrorist organization. Thank you, Zoom's trust and safety. 
Um, now, there's a lot more I could say about the way the UC responded to this incident and what it says about academic freedom, um, as well as the role of Palestine. But I think I think I've sort of done my part to, to set my side of the story, and maybe I'll turn it over uh, to, to Josh and Brian to talk about the kind of the, the, the negotiation surrounding this. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll start. Thanks, Sean. That's great. Uh, that's it. It's actually really interesting to hear it like from from your side as well, like on, on what you were receiving. So I appreciate um, all that background. Um, so uh, so let me start by uh, and I'm sort of trying to also adhere to our sort of uh, remit from a scheduling perspective. But let me sort of unpack um, the process that we followed and then invite like, you know, Brian or others to um, to, to weigh in or after I'm done, we can sort of uh, extrapolate on the, on this. But um, from a from a course of conduct perspective, when it came specifically to Leila Khaled, beginning in the September 23rd, 2020 event through the April event, uh, here what happened at Zoom was uh, we at Zoom, from a trust and safety perspective, respond to reports. We're not we don't proactively scan. We don't look for conduct like with some AI or otherwise to look for you know. Um, certain things, because for the most part, our meeting product is an end-to-end -end encrypted product, and what people say in that context is um, is is sort of confined to that, unless we receive a specific report about it. And we have reporting mechanisms where reports will come in, and we'll evaluate those reports pursuant to a process. So we did receive a variety of reports around Ms. Khaled back in September, and based on those reports, we undertook an analysis of like, do we believe that we can host Leila Khaled um, on Zoom? Or do we have uh, any sorts of obligations to, uh, from, a, from a legal perspective, a legal risk perspective or otherwise, um, allowing us to continue to allow this event to go forward with Leila Khaled being a participant? And, and let, me, let me just highlight that language that you quoted, Sean, in, in the response you received, which was um, a very, careful distinction I want to make, which which might be in some in some folks' minds a distinction without a difference. But it for, for me, where I sit and from where we sit, it's a it's a, a very careful distinction. And that is the notice says the event cannot proceed so long as Layla Khaled is a participant. Um, right. Because like what I want to emphasize is is that for the most part, Zoom really is doesn't want to want to be in the in the world of the making academic freedom determinations. We don't want to be in the circumstance where we're sitting in the shoes of the university and calling balls and strikes like this event is OK and this event's not OK. Like we want to try to avoid that at pretty much all costs. We don't have any bone to pick with Palestinian voices. We don't have any bone to pick with Jewish voices. We don't have any uh, bone to pick with black voices or any other sort of uh, you know, group that wants to represent themselves and use Zoom uh, to share their voices. So for us, the decision really did um, boil down to whether Ms. Khaled was a participant in the event. Um, and each decision we made with respect to Layla Khaled appearing in a particular event was based on the fact that she was part of the event. So, but I do wanna sort of like laid out again, the timeline. So September 23rd happened, we made, we took the decision in that case to um, withhold access to that particular event. Now, the other thing that Zoom tries to do is be very narrowly targeted in terms of the action we take. So, for example, Professor Malloy um, is not going to be blocked or banned from Zoom simply because Professor Malloy chooses to host an event with, with Ms. Khaled being a participant. So our actions are very narrowly conscribed to the particular thing that we um, that we were focused on in that sense, which was the meeting with Ms. Khaled's participation. So that, that's sort of thing number one. But the whole time when we started to make the decision, we, we felt we had an obligation to work very closely with basically our community and our customers. And in this particular instance, like universities um, around the country and if not world, use Zoom and we're proud of that. So what we decided to do was we would start uh, engaging a series of dialogues with universities and university leadership and faculty members in different um, uh, universities and start discussing like, how could we get to the point where Zoom uh, could re retain some uh, ability, um, where we believe there was legal or regulatory risk or risk of real harm to a human being to take certain actions and yet preserve the university's right um, to uh, you know, maintain academic freedom. And so then we started having a series of conversations, a series of meetings with some folks um, uh, and so we could gain perspective, right? Um, and that included, again, some faculty members, some really smart people, including a couple people in this room. So thank you to them. 
um, uh, Kate and Brian. We've, we had a chance to talk with both of you uh, to gain your perspective. Um, and, and quite frankly, we met with a lot of different people that were probably not as friendly um, as Kate and Brian were <laughs> um, in our engaging discussion, but Zoom sort of has a, uh, we have really thick skin. We like to engage in discussion so we can try to get to a good outcome, the best outcome we can in the circumstances. So we engaged in a series of conversations and out of that conversation uh, was born this uh, academic freedom uh, comment that we've now posted on our, our webpage for everybody to read. Um, and then, as, as you said, Sean, it's nice to hear <laughs> out of a coincidence purely of timing, um, uh, we had published that academic freedom comment. And then in about 30 minutes later, we received notification of the um, of Ms. Collette's event uh, or your event featuring Ms. Collette and others, of course. Um, and so we immediately were like, well, great. Uh, we published this new academic freedom comment and we're already immediately being sort of like tested for it. But that, I mean, that's that's OK. We, that's why we get paid the big bucks. But um, uh, and so we were sort of immediately forced to uh, confront the parameters of the of this academic freedom policy. And a lot of folks were reaching out to Zoom. I won't name names from a variety of sources saying like, was this planned? Um, you know, was this your way of like suggesting that you're going to let the Layla Khaled event proceed in this scenario, but not you know in the past? And so we had to sort of uh, deal with that a lot. But we also were maintaining um, a sense of quiet because, as part of the academic freedom comment, it spells out that we're going to consult with the university and the university leadership as part of the process. We're going to engage in a dialogue with with them. So we're going to notify them, engage in a dialogue, figure out what the parameters of the event are. Is there any way we can, if we believe that we have to invoke a provision in there, in this case, it's the first bullet point. Like, is there some way we can still allow the event to proceed from a risk perspective where, um, where we're satisfied it doesn't carry, uh, you know, risk for Zoom in this context and yet allow the event to proceed? And so we really did engage in a sort of a back and forth dialogue, like uh, proposal, counter proposal. We gave some time to discuss it um, amongst the parties to understand the parameters. And so it was a really good test of how that uh, academic freedom comment could be used. Unfortunately, in this test, um, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, um, uh, it resulted in Ms. Khaled's um, and the event featuring Ms. Khaled to be taken down. So I, that's sort of my starting comment. Hopefully that didn't just vary from left to right too much, but. Thanks, I on you. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, Brian, you are involved particularly from the uh, Academic Senate side at UC uh, in this discussion with uh, Zoom of academic the academic freedom statement. Could you uh, weigh in on some of the uh, things that occurred? Yeah, of course. I think there's the there's the narrow issue uh, of the cancellation of the uh, very important, but uh, the specific issue of the cancellation of these events really alerted us in the late fall to uh, what seemed like a larger problem that we hadn't yet confronted, which is just the fact that uh, Zoom, like most other uh, content providers and uh, platforms like this, uh, have their own set of content moderation policies. And at Zoom, that's been a shifting target. Uh, it's changed, it seems, two or three times since I started uh, working on uh, this issue, but at the time that we started looking at it, let's say last November, uh, the Zoom's policies prohibited posting or sending hateful imagery, uh, prohibited the celebration of any violent act that may inspire others to replicate it. It uh, prohibited depictions of any form of gory media related to death, serious injury, violence, or surgical procedures, or media that depicts death. Uh, there was a default restriction on nudity. There was a, a ban on impersonating anyone where that was defined as pretending to be someone you are not. A uh, ban on engaging in activity that is false or misleading and communicating any material that's indecent. And this is just a set of things that as a public university, were we to impose uh, such restrictions on speech, it would just be patently unconstitutional. Uh, the kinds of limits in terms of discussions of violence, in terms of what the medical school can depict in its training, uh, in terms of surgical procedures, uh, what the 
moot trial teams are doing when they're impersonating someone, uh, you know, our mascots, uh, you know, aren't, turns out, aren't really uh, who they say they are. All of this was banned under the terms of the policy. And so our move, uh, you know, the provost's response to the canceled uh, events in the, in the fall acknowledged that Zoom was a, is a private company that can make its own rules. And of course we agreed with that. And yet we're also uh, a party to a contract. And so our, our push was let's get the University of California to throw some of its weight around and try to renegotiate its contract with Zoom. Uh, so the faculty called on the administration to do that uh, at the beginning of this calendar year. Um, and Zoom's response was great because they didn't, they went beyond what we were calling for, where our ask was originally, let's see if the University of California can get a new contract. Uh, Zoom ended up responding with the academic freedom policy that Josh was just talking about, which applies to all higher ed accounts on Zoom. Uh, so it's a major change where the big move in the policy is that except in certain particular situations, one is the one that got invoked with uh, Sean's event where Zoom is exposed to legal risk, uh, except for those um, enumerated things. So legal risk, if there's imminent physical harm that is being, that you can see, or uh, what's your third one? Oh, if, if it's uh, unrelated to the institution's academics or operations. Except for those three categories, Zoom has handed over content moderation to universities. And that's a huge change. And it's one that I hope that uh, others will follow as well. You know, I hope that this could be a model for others because you know, what we realize is none of us were prepared for this situation. The universities clearly weren't prepared for what happens when literally everything we do gets moved on to a private platform like Zoom. Uh, and Zoom wasn't ready for it. Zoom isn't a company that uh, was founded in order to run universities, right? Zoom, uh, Zoom was suddenly thrust into a set of debates that people on this call are very used to having, uh, debates around the First Amendment, debates around academic freedom. But that's not what the lawyers and staff at Zoom had their expertise in or thought they were getting into, uh, you know, 18 months ago um, when they may have joined the company. So it, it was a big learning experience. It's one that uh, I'm quite happy with the result in terms of uh, the new policy. It does still leave this issue of what do we do with uh, the material support problem. My committee's most recent statement on this uh, basically says the University of California should be taking the lead here again. Uh, because although it might seem as if we didn't really solve the ultimate issue, given that events are still being canceled, events like Sean's, were we to clarify whether there actually is legal liability, whether in this case, the federal statute that prohibits material support for terrorism, uh, whether that applies to academic seminars like Sean's, if we were able to just clarify that legal issue and say, for example, no, that doesn't apply, the, the law doesn't ban that, then that exception to Zoom's academic freedom policy would no longer apply here. And it would come back to the University of California and to universities in general to decide in this event, like any others, whether it should, you know, the default is that it will go forward unless it falls in one of the very, very rare uh, narrow categories in which you know there's harassment or incitement or something like that where you know we actually would limit an academic event uh, and so that would be that would be huge progress um, Kate um, Josh mentioned that you were also part of a party to these discussions so what's your perspective on this um, well thank you for having me and this has been a great summary so far um, I, so it's interesting to kind of to hear kind of how all of this has played out behind the scenes and everything else. I would say that when I talked to Josh, one of the big picture, um, big picture things that I told him is that there is this intractable problem of content moderation that platforms are being saddled with. And that in particular, Zoom treats itself, if you kind of think of things at various points in the internet stack, where kind of things that are like the actual ISPs and internet service providers are at the bottom and they are literally the pipe. And then you kind of go up the stack 
And like at the top of the stack, the Facebook social media is kind of what you think of as platforms for individual speech and user generated content. Um, and Zoom is somewhere in between there, right? Like it is it is definitely publishing stuff that I have no idea how many people are watching this right now, but we are publishing this entire conference through Zoom. And it's not Zoom's content, it's our content. And so like, you know, this is, and so this kind of, that's that's something that they're necessarily a part of. But at the same time, as, as Josh said, just because of the infrastructure of it, end-to-end -end encryption, for example, there cannot be an active and the medium of, of video. There cannot be this regular kind of uh, checking on, um, checking on kind of everything that's happening in any type of event or any type of thing, nor nor would you want to, right? Um, but so what I basically kind of I, I expressed, and I think that this is kind of, we're seeing this play out right now, is you're going to have, we're having a hard time as a society trying to figure out where these private public platforms sit. Like, is this public, this is, is this a private event or a public event? Well, like anyone can log into this right now if you had pre-registered. Does that make it private or does that make it public? You know, if it's on, if it's up on YouTube later, does that make it public or is that still private? There are all of these various types of strictures that we're kind of used to sorting, like sorting speech through in terms of legality that don't directly apply in these scenarios. And then there's, of course, market interests and business interests and, and other things that are kind of, you know, at the at the bottom of this. So this is not just something that's happening for Zoom. This is happening for Cloudflare, which was asked to deplatform the Daily Stormer. It's happening for Amazon Web Services, which was asked, you know, which is a server. Like they don't look at anything that's on their servers. Like they don't want to look at what's on their servers. That's not the business they're in. Unlike Facebook and Twitter, which do make a curated platform with a specific set of rules part of their, you know, part of what they're selling. They're giving you a Disney World or they're giving you a biker bar. They're giving you whatever it is that you want it to be through their kind of imposition of their rule things. But that's not, I dare I say, Josh, that's not what you're trying to do. That's not what Zoom wants to do at all. Um, and to, to your point, just quickly to wrap up, to your last point, Brian, about how this shifts over time and these community standards shift over time, I mean, as well they should. I think that we don't have, um, I don't think that we have a very good set of norms around this. I don't think we've fully grappled with how we want to think of these spaces and what the fallout is for thinking, putting them in one category or the other. And there was this very like profound moment that we all went through as a society in which all of us, the slowest, the oldest, the youngest, the ever, were forced to be in this online intermediary environment that was completely dependent on, on these private platforms. And now this has been like a real sea change, I think, about people thinking about what their rights are vis-a-vis -vis these platforms, about how to think of these platforms as spaces or not, you know? And so I think that, uh, I think that we're gonna kind of continue to grapple with this. And this is the most uh, recent and kind of just fascinating moment of all of that happening. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, Kate, I, they, I, I mean, one of the reasons we reached out to uh, folks like Kate and, and Brian is just to engage in this conversation in good faith. Um, again, like I said, we're not afraid to have these conversations. We ourselves are thinking very hard about it and even struggling in how to characterize Zoom, right? Because I think, Brian, you made the great point, which is that, you know, Zoom in late 2019, as compared to even Zoom today, are just completely different animals. Um, the fact that an event could be uh, publicized publicly is a different use case for us, right? I mean, people weren't generally using Zoom for that in late 2019 or even early 2020, and it sort of changes a little bit of our analysis. Um, and it's really interesting, to your point, Brian, like when we um, created the community standards and we were thinking about their applicability, you know, universities were perfectly uh, correct to reach out to us or to react to that as, as our enterprise customers and businesses. Well, how does this apply to our private communications? Like, how are you viewing those things? And so back to Kate's point, like, what is Zoom? Uh, Zoom is uh, figuring that out. Um, regulators are starting to figure out, out. I think the FCC chair quite recently did a, um, a press conference and the title of the press conference is, what is Zoom? Um, and so uh, the, the, the other side of that coin is, is that all around the world, we have regulators, whether it be in the EU or in India or in the, 
in uh, Indonesia or Australia are also uh, um, uh, uh, holding Zoom um, or other platforms that could maybe include Zoom um, to standards around how it combats abuse or how it views abuse in its platform. So, um, so in the broader conversation, taking it ten, you know ten steps away from Professor Malloy's event, right? Is that those are the the big sticky wickets that even we internally to Zoom are are um, are struggling with, and we're we're up for the task, but we also want to make sure that we are taking advantage of those people that have like deep thinking around this, whether it be folks in this room, other members of civil society, even regulators. We reach out to um, to a bunch of folks to try to find that balance and be a little bit like forward leaning to the extent that we we can um, uh, around these areas. It's, it's, it's very, very challenging. We don't like, we, we really don't like uh, uh, Sean um, uh, turning off events. That's not our favorite uh, outcome by any stretch. And we've done it, we've done it quite rarely, but, but those are the things I think we and other platforms are struggling with quite a bit. Well, the first, you know, one of the answers, probably the first answer to what is Zoom is it's a private corporation. Mm -hmm. Right. I think I don't want to denigrate the hard work that Brian and Kate and Josh and others did to get you through the, the statement you got. Um, but I think there are problems with it that go beyond simply the fact that my event happened to fall in one of the, the loopholes. Um, and that, you know, uh, after this after this call today, Josh, you could you could get off this call and say, you know, having actually met some of these professors now, um, they absolutely cannot be trusted. We, we you know. And you can go back and you can tell your CEO, you know, we need to, we, we need to, like, I saw this Malloy guy, this is no good. Um, we need to, we need to have a new policy and, and abandon our old commitment to, you know, ab abandon our old policy, right? You can change your policy tomorrow. And uh, the academic Senate wouldn't be consulted. Um, you know, we would have no recourse essentially, right? Because you are ultimately a private corporation. Um, you have made a proactive effort in this case to work with universities, but at the end of the day, you answer to your shareholders and to your boss. You don't answer to the university. And, and that to me, I think raises a larger question that goes well beyond Zoom, right? About what does, you know, sort of going to the title of the symposium that Robert put together, right? What does academic freedom mean in an online world where universities are reliant largely on private platforms, right? So when, when, I, when I went to my administration and said, hey, Zoom, may not carry this, what can you do for me? They said, well, we're totally supportive of your event, but if Zoom doesn't carry you, you're shit out of luck. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't use those exact words, but that was that, that was the sentiment, right? That, well, sorry, um, we'd love to help you. You know, our lawyers will work on this, but there's no alternative to Zoom. And so what does it mean when the greatest public research university in the world um, can say we support academic freedom, we support your event, but then can't actually back that up, right? Um, and I think that raises much larger questions about the age we live in. If we don't, if universities control the digital platforms that we use to distribute significant parts of our content, and I think that will continue after the pandemic, we're really not in a position to say we can guarantee academic freedom. Uh, it becomes more aspirational than, than actionable when we don't control those platforms. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I, I completely, I, I completely, I understand the, the argument. I think it's a great argument. We are a private company and we are responsible to our shareholders. I will say that, and I think we're seeing this more in society, not just with Zoom, but with many different companies, that the customers in this case do have a lot of power with Zoom. Um, while I think we're the best um, product out there and uh, brought to you by Zoom, um, I do think that like, um, you know, University of California has the power of the purse. Like they could go to one of our competitors. I hope they don't. Um, I hope um, they don't. I hope many of the other universities don't go to our competitors. Um, so I do think there's, a, there's some market power there and I, I don't dispute your overall point, Sean, I think. Um, and, then, and then again, what we're seeing is uh, regulators and others are um, trying to hold us accountable. Civil society is trying to hold us accountable. And we, I mean, again, we're one platform and your point is bigger than Zoom. Um, but, it, but I do think that market power, especially with a company like Zoom does make a difference. And, and the UC, you know, having the comments through Brian that this is something that's um, really important to them uh, to maintain the relationship with Zoom is a very powerful voice that they that they used. We we happen to also want to try to do the right thing in our position, and academic freedom feels like the right thing to do for Zoom. Um, but that market power should not be underestimated. Sorry, Robert, I think I interrupted you. 
I know I, I wanted to switch over to Robert Post. I think in particular, uh, you know, from a faculty member's point of view, uh, when we think about the content of our courses, the content of the events we're going to be involved in, uh, we are doing that relying on assumptions about academic freedom. And if those are not solid and not there to protect us in what we do, we really need to know that, or if they're changing in some way. So let me throw that over to Robert Post with some remarks. So I think Sean's question really raises the question of what do we mean by academic freedom? That's what you're asking basically. All right, so a couple of distinctions at the outset. Um, academic freedom doesn't trump general laws, right? You can't use academic freedom to sell child pornography. So there are general laws and they affect what you can and cannot say as a professor, publish or teach as a professor. In the United States, whether a general law is valid depends upon a constitutional analysis under the First Amendment. So we have to put a law through that screen. So in 2015, they put a law about aiding and abetting foreign terrorists through the screen of the First Amendment. And in what I think myself is a terrible decision, the court said, you can regulate that. That's not protected by the First Amendment. So the first thing is, do we have a valid general law? And we use the First Amendment to assess that. And sometimes we use academic freedom to test whether a law is valid. In particular cases, those tend to be laws as applied to a university or that specify or target a university. It's a weak screen in the United States. It's a weak screen throughout the world. So it doesn't tend to have a lot of constitutional bite. The big bite is the First Amendment. And unfortunately, you ran head into a law, which the court had decided was OK, was valid. And academic freedom doesn't trump a general valid law. So that leads to the next question. I think you were exactly right, Sean, to say, well, Zoom is a private company. Yes, it is. So we're dealing with the intersection of academic freedom with the market. What is the relationship of academic freedom with the market? So we can do a thought experiment and think about that for a second. So we all say, right, to get tenure, you have to publish your second book. Who publishes the second book? You know, publishing companies. And the premise is, of course, if it's a good thing, it'll get published. Somebody in the market will pick it up. But underlying that thought is a thousand assumptions about how the book publishing market works. Suppose there are only two publishers, just like, you know, there's Zoom and nothing else, let's say, Josh. You know, there's just, just this one publisher, and that's the only one you can get. And then they, as a private entity, decide, well, I don't want to publish that. It's not profitable. Or for whatever reasons, they decide as a private publisher, they don't want to publish your book. What does academic freedom mean in that context? We don't even have an analysis of it because our whole thinking about academic freedom presupposes a well-functioning market. And what we don't have in this context of digital distribution is a well-functioning market. We have monopoly power of the kind that Zoom is because of the quality of its product or whatever it is, I'm assuming it's the quality of the product. So that leads to the question of, well, what do we do when the market fails? This is an old neoliberal question, right? <laughs> this is the question. We don't have a functioning market. I mean, we have antitrust laws, but we have a number of things for that. But one of the things that it leads to is the question of if Zoom is the intermediary for communications and Zoom isn't, um, Zoom has monopoly power, what do we want to say about Zoom from a legal perspective? So we were asking earlier, saying, what is Zoom? My answer, Josh, is Zoom is its community standards. So you define yourself as you define the standards by which you will censor or not censor people who use your product. And um, imagine you were a telephone in say 1905. If you had community standards, it would be a big problem on the telephone because you would be censoring the total communication of, of the public. And so the law at that time, imagine telephones as something we call a common carrier. It's like, you know, you're a ferryman at a bridge. You have to take all commerce. You don't get to make judgments. The only judgments you make are the application of general laws. So there's a general law and then everything consistent with the general law, you have to accept a paying customer. This is not the way private markets ordinarily work, but we have a legal category, common carriers, where we impose it on them. And my guess is Zoom is caught between on the one hand wanting to be a common carrier and on the one hand wanting to be a private market actor that can have discretion about who it carries. This is a deep uncertainty and it's going to lead to legal uncertainty and how the state 
will regard Zoom because the state can intervene and say, guess what? You may want to be a private actor. You're a common carrier. You're like the telephone. We're going to regulate you like that. Then that will go before the a court. And is that consistent with the First Amendment? Is Zoom a speaker or is Zoom a carrier? So we're going to have those questions. My guess is Zoom will be a carrier given the way it works. And then Zoom won't be able to make any distinctions except what's legal, not legal. Yeah, um, I think you nailed it. That's that is the yeah, I mean, that's the core question about what is Zoom, right? Like that is so I agree with your point about our community standards or our current core principles, but like fundamentally, how's the US government what does the government treat Zoom? Are we a common carrier? Because like you said, there's an established set of laws that say if I, if we are in fact a common carrier, well, there's all kinds of other things we have to worry about from a regulatory and legal perspective. But on the concept in the content moderation space, at least as the current law is is drafted. Like we're out of the business of content moderation, if that is what Zoom is. Correct. Um, and that's the th and that's the thing that we think about, right? Like, but Zoom's product offerings, and again, we have we have ownership of this vary to some extent, and how that product is used, and that is where like either we have to make a decision within Zoom, are we going to, I guess, apply to be X, Y, and Z, or are we not? Um, but if we, for example, just confine ourselves to more like phone type discussions, like you said. So if this was just the uh, seven of us or six of us in this call and we were just having a discussion, that's a, that's basically a phone call. Um, but if we publicize the event and tweet it out and you know host it with the Center uh, for Studies in Higher Education and make it accessible to everybody, can we still in that context be considered a common carrier? Yes, you could. I mean, think about a news conference over the phone that some you know, candidate is having, that's very common. So mm -hmm. this isn't quite public, not public. Yeah. This is common carry or not, which is to say, do you have a voice or are you just the passive vehicle for others' voices? That's mm -hmm. the question. And it's very unfair to put it on legal to make a decision like that. Can I raise uh, a point that both this is like making me um, think of, which relates to kind of telephone companies and kind of common carriers, which is like, what about, like you said before, Robert, what if the market is failing us? Like, what do we do when the market fails? Classic neoliberal problem. But like, what if it is too soon to tell whether the market has failed? I think this is a very, there is an expectation that we will sort through so all of these very complicated questions within nine months of a new technology arriving on the scene. And the entire world shifts out from underneath us. We had an entire global pandemic. Like Zoom was a fairly, no offense, Josh, like not widely used platform. It certainly wasn't verb, like turned into a verb yet, right? Like like in common parlance. Um, and But like then everyone used it. Why? Because it was actually one of the most nimble and light and like low, like demanding on bandwidth, um, like infrastructures that existed. Um, and I think that, and it totally transformed its, its share of the market space. Um, and I think that this is, uh, I think that this is super interesting. It's like, why do we expect that the market has failed? It has been like, like basically like 18 months of insanity. Like, should we want there to be kind of an ossification or a not, like, can we judge yet whether the, the market has ossified? I just don't know. And I'm not saying that I'm pro market at all. Like, I'm just thinking like, I actually just have no idea. When there were no, when, when people lived in tenement apartments so they didn't have kitchens and they couldn't bake their own bread, bakers were considered like a common carrier. They're price regulated. They were a public utility. Then when people got private homes, baker, you know, suddenly you couldn't regulate the price of bread. So these things change in law as you project the future. And of course you could make mistakes, but in the end you got to gamble. And you know, if the big issue for Zoom, which is why what you were to negotiate with Brian is so terrific, is you avoid bringing this to a head. So you can live in this ambivalent amphibious state for a while until things settle out. So I, I should know better than to argue with Robert Post about academic freedom. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do take something of an issue with the publishing analogy, right? Because um, the fact is, yeah, we, we, we academics are relying on publishers um, for our livelihood, right? For our tenure. Uh, it's one of the reasons we have university presses, right? Because we have, we have presses that are not directly accountable to the marketplace, right? We do insulate ourselves from the marketplace because we recognize 
that the market will always succeed on the terms of the market, right? The market will ultimately do what the market does. Whether that meshes with our values as an institution or not is, is an open question and ultimately not something we can control. So uh, I mean, I think maybe the common carrier is a solution there, right? That they may mean a private company, but they're a common carrier. But I do think, you know, in our publishing, we have recognized that we need, that sometimes our values as a university are not marketable or, or, or will not be served by the market and that we need to come with, with, with our own kind of solutions to that. And, you know, maybe common carrier solves that. But I, I do think we need to acknowledge that, that, you know, historically markets have not necessarily served universities well. And despite the kind of neoliberal turn from the, the 70s onward, and I've, you know, I've watched over the course of my relatively brief career, the, the extent to which, you know, corporate interests have become deeply entrenched in the university system. Um, but I think that's something we also we need to guard about and not ask, is the market working right now? But how can we remove ourselves and our ability to think and teach and disseminate our findings, remove that from the marketplace entirely? That's totally brilliant, totally brilliant. But what happens when the university press start failing and they start becoming like commercial presses, which is what's happening, right? Because they can't subsidize it. We can subsidize anything we want. If we want to subsidize a new Zoom, as a university, it's within our power to do it, but that doesn't mean it's in, within our ability to do it because we may lack the resources. And that's especially true of a technology like a digital one where you need end to end, where there needs to be a common technology for all the users. So we could say, join the UC platform and nobody else has the software. How many, what is our audience gonna be? So, you know, alas. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, it goes back to this larger context in which I think, you know, academic freedom and all of these kinds, all of the things we're talking about exist in a larger system of power, right? And, you know, I think the next question, okay, why don't we have the resources to do this, right? And then that goes back to a larger set of questions about public education, um, you know, questions that this very center has studied about, you know, we take it for granted, oh, we don't have the resources to start our own Zoom. Well, why don't we, right? And asking, I think, those questions and, you know, to me, that, that's, that academic freedom is great, but it exists within a, in a larger society and network of power. And we always need to be interrogating that and not taking it for granted. Just well, so. You know, um, just to follow up a little bit on the publishing issue, um, we do have a recent case in which our university values, in particular academic freedom values, when we insisted upon them, we did get traction, which was on the issues of open access publications with Elsevier. So we asserted that we wanted to have open access and we got it ultimately um, because we were able to influence the market in that regard because we are the content suppliers. Um, so I think going back, I think Brian was making this point earlier on, uh, we do have influence on what goes on and what happens because without us, there's no content to be shared. Without us, there's no intellectual content, no academic content. So I don't think that we are unable at all. We do have these, you know, clear cases where we can influence the market. Yeah, the issue isn't whether we can or can't influence the market. Of course we should and do to the extent we have the power to do it. The question is, how do we theorize the relationship between academic freedom and a market? Granted. I just, I want to note in the discussion about uh, common carriers and all, the way in which uh, even the metaphor of community standards, you know, puts a thumb on the scale and in a way that you really wonder whether Zoom wants to have that at all. Uh, you know, what is like going to Robert's point, we would never talk about the AT&T community. There is no such thing, right? Uh, the phone company's community. And so the question is, is there a Zoom community? Uh, there's, a, there's a real difference between terms of service and community standards, uh, just in the metaphor that's that's employed there. And, you know, it seems as if the academic freedom issues were almost a limit case of just how absurd it would be uh, for Zoom to be making these decisions. But I think there's an even further limit case uh, that's almost a reductio type argument against this, which is the fact that uh, during this period, courts have been, the federal courts have been running on Zoom. You know, the idea that, and they're of course, technically subject to the same community standards in terms of service. The idea that Zoom 
could ever cut off content uh, in the federal courts just strikes us as so outlandish. And, you know, I think Josh would probably say, much as people said to me when I started working on this, oh, well, Zoom would never cut off that kind of that kind of content. They would never actually step in there. But of course, if that's how we feel, assuming we all accept that, then the terms of service should reflect that, right? The 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 regulations that we agree to in our contracts, uh, whether we're a University of California or whether we're the you know Central District of California, uh, should reflect the actual practice, the the actual commitments that we're we're making. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's a use case, right? So I think uh, Ryan, what you're talking about is a use case. So if we're talking about in the context of universities, and and I'll just talk about a court setting in a minute as well, what it doesn't necessarily account for is, uh, you know, the meeting disruption phenomenon, for example, where somebody joins a meeting and does uh, posts hate speech or uh, or you know other sundry horrible things in the content in the co context of a of a meeting, for example. And then the question is, is like, what if that is reported to Zoom, what do we do to that user? And how do we notify that user that we are actually think being thoughtful about the action we take against that user, right? So it is a form of abuse and it's a form of abuse, which, which is terrible and it happened a lot. Um, and so that's a use case. If I'm hosting an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and it's disrupted, which sadly they are because they're public and their links are posted, um, you know, or, uh, and then the ACP event or, uh, we had a case involving a, a, a Jewish funeral, right? I mean, those are circumstances where somebody did something terrible. We don't want it on our platform, um, but we want to be transparent about the decisions that we're making uh, with respect to those users um, and why we're making them. So that it, it goes back to us, like, again, back to Robert's point, like, I guess if we were a common carrier and the, there was a regulatory regime that we would, you know, be governed by to some extent, that might sort of make the case, right? But when we have public events and we have people doing terrible things in the context of those events or other forms of abuse, we feel an obligation to um, take action against those uh, quote bad users, but in a way that's tr as transparent as possible. Like you are a bad user because you violated this rule. We notify you violated this rule. We've taken this action and then try to describe those proportionate actions. And that's where it gets blurry for us from a, from, from a sort of quote platform perspective. So I'm going to point at another place where it gets blurry for you, um, if, I, if I can, which is that we've talked this most of this time talking about the UC the schools in the United States. And Zoom, does, of course, does not operate just in the United States. And in fact, having this type of like, well, we'll defer to like a national, like a, na a nation's law um, and then to a university is, you know, is an interesting choice. But that is surely not these are all not going, your academic freedom principle is not going, the idea of a freedom of expression principle is not going to always be coming through necessarily a university or university accounts. Um, and the other part of this is that it's a very nice thing to do to defer, to, to kick the can down the road and give the con hard content moderation questions to a university or to like, you know, a, like a, a, a free expression loving country like the United States. And it's entirely different when you're operating in India and Thailand and Vietnam and Taiwan, like, or if you are like, and I think these are, these are much different types of, these are much different types of choices in that, in that kind of world and deferring, you are going to be called on just as you're being called on to do the right thing with this type of, in this type of instance, and you see by like certain types of people who think that this is speech that shouldn't stay up, even in the auspices of academic freedom, you're gonna be asked the exact same thing in an autocratic regime, in an undemocratic world, in a, like in, in an, or in a place that is a democratic country, but has a despotic leader that is rising up. And so like, these are the types of choices that the platforms are being put in. And there just is only a matter of time that you can rely on the norms that have been developed within your own community, which suffice it to say would basically, we've been talking about the norms of the US and a very elite set of norms at that, the norms of higher education. 
Yeah. I mean, two things. You wound me with the kick the can on the road comment. Um, but no, uh, just a couple things. There's no uh, other choice, by the way. Know, That's the only thing you can do. <laughs> no, I know, I'm teasing. I mean, so a couple things. Uh, um, the, pro the challenge that you're articulating is a challenge, but a couple things about a little bit more thought that we put to the academic freedom comment, which I acknowledge uh, um, does apply to universities. There's a bit, little bit of a language we put in there um, which was designed to, to address the international universities, um, uh, that particular context. And that is the com that this comment is for any higher education institution that has academic freedom policies substantially similar to the AAUPs inside the classroom or policies protecting speech on campus that are similar to rules governing US um, public universities. Not a perfect, not, it, it's not a perfect solution, but at least it's indicative that like we are trying to think about it, um, right? Like that, um, and that is very Western centric. I, I will concede that point, um, but it's a, li a little bit of an attempt to navigate that exact problem set. Like, what do we do if it's a Indian university? What do we do if it's a, uh, you know, a, a Filipino university, et cetera? And then the second thing is, is I think the challenge that you throw out is, is one that, everybody in the world of digital cyberspace is trying to solve, quite frankly, um, to not um, uh, push too greatly uh, into just US-based norms and to grasp uh, you know, for some better international norms. And one of the things you struggle with, whether you're Zoom or Facebook or whatever, is finding those international norms to like link to, to draw upon. And that, that can be, that, that is an existing challenge for us. We, we reach out to, uh, like I'm sure I've, the other platforms do, but you know we participated in events like Access Now and trying to like link with a lot of international human rights organizations to just get some thoughts, right? Like how should we be viewing some of this stuff? We may, to Sean, Professor Malloy's point earlier, not follow them all because we're a private company, um, but like trying to gain that perspective is helpful. But we do struggle with that, Kate, right? Like I think every, every platform does. What are those norms that we're gonna align to? Well, to quote, um, a great professor and mentor of mine, Robert Post, there is no such thing as a global set of norms yeah. Yeah. because there is no such thing as a global community and you can't have a global set of norms without having a global, I mean, doing okay, Robert, Oh my God, okay. But you can't have, you, there are, and I think that he is completely correct. I mean, this is a, this is one of the things that I think is, um, is that there is, speaks towards the inevitable balkanization of speech rule sets in these online spaces is the fact that they're just, we're never going to get to a place where European norms are going to be the same as American, especially not the same as Chinese. And like all of these things are gonna be in competition and they're just going to end up being large chunks of, of like governance by different rule sets. But doesn't that like, isn't that like, so not that I don't agree with Professor Post and, and Professor Klonick, but like, um, that's it's almost like giving up right i mean um I, I don't i don't dispute the point but like doesn't all right i love it I'll uh, let it's, not giving, <laughs> it's not giving up it means that it has to bubble up you need the structures by which these things develop when they don't exist you can't pretend they exist when they don't mm -hmm. if, if i could add just one other point here i'm reading your community norms i was actually kind of shocked to discover you had community norms because I wouldn't have thought this was the kind of platform that would, but you were earlier drawing the distinction between, I think you called it a, a use versus like bombing into a use. Mm -hmm. So um, that distinction is not in your community standards. Your community standards are applying to, I'm having the equivalent of a phone call and I can't abuse. I'm having the equivalent of a phone call and I can't be hateful. That's very different than saying, like AT&T would say, you can't wiretap, you can't intervene in a, I mean, that's a totally different use of community standards. Right, yeah, no, I, so we tried to put further context around that in, in response to this exact uh, comment in our trust center. So, right, which has some, uh, some questions and answers around like how we apply it and how heavily context driven it is. And that's uh, zoom.us backslash trust center if you click on trust and safety because we've tried to draw some clarity publicly around how we might apply those in those circumstances. So that's the implementation though, not what the norm is. That's We're talking there about enforcement guides. You're saying if somebody on the call complains, well, that just introduces uncertainty of what you really mean is you can't intervene into a call and say hateful things when you weren't invited. 
these are different kinds of it's like this is why that like zoom is not the telephone company i mean it is it can be this is the use point it also is like a university lecture hall it mm -hmm. is also like a university classroom and it is also like you know a sh like a like a local television channel or you know or like all of these various things all of those are things that it is it is just like it is going to be a floating question i think for a long time how how you define each of you those could things. post it you could post a tweet and invite nine thousand people into your into your meeting and uh have a a, a giant orgy on it um we we don't that that would violate our community standards so please don't do that um, but you could do that. Um, and so again, I think, I, I mean, I, I take the point, um, but I think it, that's the issue that Kate, that's the use case issue, right? That Zoom is being used for all sorts of things. And, and, and from the perspective of the university, right? Where you're picking up a phone call on Zoom phone, hopefully, um, or having a meeting like with Zoom, right? That, that use case doesn't become immediately apparent because that's the, that's the way you're, you're, that's the Zoom world you're living in. Um, but from our perspective, we're getting it from all sides. Like, oh, somebody hosted a, a naked yoga class and they started fornicating, right? Do we let that happen um, in Zoom? And we Why do you care? Zoom. Why do you care if it happens? Uh, we've taken the decision as a company that that is not what we want Zoom to be used for. And that goes back to Sean's point. We're a private company. That's the decision we've taken. But why? Uh, because it doesn't align with our principles for Zoom's use case, a use case for Zoom. What is your principles? I mean, constructive communication. I mean, what exactly? Well, but that, but that's, that's the question. I mean, if we're talking about a forum that's just used for Professor Post to communicate with Josh, like uh, in a in a one on one call, Zoom doesn't really want a part in regulating that discussion. Or even if it's Professor Post, Professor Klonick, Professor Malloy, Professor Suchek, and Professor May, like, and you're having a closed conversation, like Zoom doesn't want any part of that. Where it gets hard is like, is Zoom being? And to your point earlier, Professor Post, like in the con going back full circle to the context of uh, Professor Malloy's event. Like that event was hosted and it featured somebody that was affiliated with a designated, ter designated ter terrorist organization. So that that's another use case. So we do care. Uh, or we're being held to a standard by regulators already or an uncertainty based on how regulators view Zoom as to what we are or are not doing to prevent abuse. I, I understand violence. you're wanting to obey the law, but why do you care if Professor Malloy has a class or a forum that goes out to a lot of people as distinct from he and I having a conversation. But why, what is the interest exactly? Well, I think it's the public nature of the event, right? It's available to, the, the use case for Zoom has changed in that context. Mm -hmm. um, why is that relevant? I mean, so it's a public event and then what follows? Oh man, I feel like, I'm, is this what it's like being in Professor Post's classroom? <laughs> um, oh, oh, yes. This is a great <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> version, Josh. <laughs> That's good. I'll take it. So uh, the question again is, why does that matter to us? Yeah. What 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 changes about the event that is public? I think I I I think the fact that it just changes the nature of the event. Again, it's publicly available to a lot of people, and there's there's expectations on Zoom that we take uh, a position as to. Um, what we allow to be Zoom to use for in that public setting as opposed to a private setting. Those are customer expectations? I think there are customer expectations. I think they're regulatory, regulator expectations. Regulator, I get. Yeah. So it's yeah. definitely customer expectations. We get customers are those that report to us. Um, but this is one of those, this is, this is one of those places though where the customer expectations I, where it's circular, right? Because I only have expectations of you or will only place demands on you if I have reason to believe that you're in the business of expressing values through your content moderation, right? If you weren't doing that, if you had an all comers policy, then I wouldn't have any expectation. I wouldn't- I, I don't wouldn't, think that's true. I don't think that's I, true. I wouldn't, there would be nothing expressive yeah, on Zoom's like, part about the fact that X or Y is happening on Zoom. It yeah, but that doesn't explain why Zoom's values. No, no, I agree. Gotten into that business. 
Uh, but the problem is, is I don't think that's true because like, and Kate made the observation earlier is that there are all kinds of people at all different layers of the stack. They're now being sort of uh, strong expectations are made of them. And those expectations are even more remote than I would argue Zooms. So when somebody reaches out to AWS and says, for example, like you can no longer host that application on your servers and AWS takes the action to remove that whole entire application off of their servers, that basically kill that and kill, kills a business. I'm not gonna talk about the values around that decision, but it does kill a business. Why do they do that? They did that because they had a tremendous amount of customer pre pressure around that, them hosting that, um, that platform, for example. Excuse me, if I just may intervene here for a moment. Um, we're at a point in time where if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question of the panelists, uh, please put that in the live chat and we'll ask that. Otherwise, we're just gonna keep the conversation going, uh, but we'll, we will interweave any, interweave any questions which the audience would like to bring up at this point during the remainder of our time. Thanks. Can I can I say one thing about why, for instance, Josh, you might decide to have community standards, which, um, there is there is also kind of i think it, the the idea of having a bright line rule so, uh, like a, like a seemingly bright line rule like no nudity oh, we know from watching community centers this is not a particularly bright line rule defining nudity is like very difficult defining sexualized content is very difficult um, but it does move quickly. It does give you an out for the borderline gray material that might be illegal and might create liability for Zoom, um, which is kind of just like child pornography and and revenge porn increasingly. And so like, I would say that having some type of bright line rule where you just can zap all of that stuff that might be in question, it's going to be completely over -sensor sensorial, in my opinion and overbroad, but it gives you an out for doing that. And it gives, um, as you said, customers this desire to point to some rule or something that they are in the bounds of or outside the bounds of. Mm -hmm. And that is something the customers want for what it's worth. They really want that type of transparency. Yeah, I mean, Kate, I think the, the easiest case, not from a um, not from an enforcement, well, a little bit of both, but the easiest case for any platform is like child sexual exploitation material, right? Like Zoom is going to do everything in its power to prevent child sexual exploitation material from coursing through its uh, its veins, so to speak, and has a legal obligation to do so in any event. But I do think it gets complicated because... Um, because again, this goes back to Robert and your question again is like, what, how is Zoom is going to be, how is Zoom going to be characterized? How is it going to be viewed? How is it going to be regulated? So when I stared down the um, Digital Services Act in the EU or the Indian, Indian Intermediary Guidelines or a bunch of new regulations that are coming to Australia, like it's not always clear how they're going to view Zoom and they're now upping the game. So now the really sticky wicket is one that uh, Professor Malloy finds himself in which is terrorism. Like how are those regulators in the EU gonna define terrorism? There's an obligation now to remove content within one hour of it being uh, brought to Zoom's attention um, from an EU member state. So there again, now we're in the position of having to really think through how, and we work with international organizations like CTG and I, et cetera, et cetera, to think about those issues. But like that's where it now starts getting more complicated because again, I think that the child sexual exploitation material issue is the sort of, there's generally a global norm generally um, to the extent we talked about global norms before around that being a bad thing. Uh, but it's the other ones that are starting to creep in and that definition of Zoom matters. So I just, I mean, put to one side like the, what's legal and illegal because you know there's nothing any of us could do with that that's a political solution that requires you know mobilization and whatever to change that but we were talking before about customer expectations and brian was saying these are um endogenous these are not exogenous they're created by the expectations so if i pick up my phone and somebody's breathing heavily my inclination is not to call AT&T and saying you're allowing people to breathe heavily on my phone. My inclination is to call police. So why wouldn't you do the same thing? Well, but that's one use case, Robert, right? Like what happens if you pick up the phone and it's a spammer that's called you 77 times from the same number? 
Now there actually is a regulatory regime that holds AT&T obligated to make sure that spammer is not using AT&T. Right, right, but I wouldn't have called, I would have called the FTC in the first place or the FCC, I wouldn't have called AT&T. Right, right. Well, maybe. Um, I'm sure AT&T gets lots of calls or notes or emails um, that says, why are you not doing a better job of keeping, um, you know, the spammer from calling me multiple times? I'm so curious we do, whether they do. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I bet you they do based on what I see. Um, just at Zoom. So I, I would yeah. bet you they do. Yeah, yeah. We have a question from from the chat, um, which actually goes to something I was also interested in. Um, so you were trying to make a distinction between that which is sort of open to the public and that's with private, but there's some gray area in between. So for example, if the five professors on this were having a conversation with Leila Khaled about exa with exactly the content she was going to present at Sean's presentation, word got out about that. Uh, would Zoom act? Well, the question that was asked uh, on the chat is, I'm wondering whether Zoom would permit Leila Khaled to create a Zoom account and organize private meetings of individuals she's associated with. Um, so the question is, you know, to what extent can you intervene in things in which are sensibly, by your definition, I presume private, yet involve people who are, would otherwise be banned from public events. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So let me, let me start with uh, the, the so, sort of how trust and safety in Zoom works given the nature of the product, right? So say this was a closed call between the six of us, the, uh, uh, the, the five of you professors and, and the knucklehead me. Um, I, first of all, like I wouldn't know right that Layla Khaled was necessarily on this call. Like I suppose one of you could report it to Zoom and assuming that we were um, responding on a live basis, right? That we were able yeah. to every call. Somehow the, word, somehow the word gets to you. Yeah. And then the second question would be like, what evidence do we have actually to take an action? Because I can't join your call. I can't see the call. Um, I can't understand the content of the call. I may not even be able to definitively identify that Layla Khaled is a participant in the call. Um, and so I'm pretty limited in what I can do from the trust and safety perspective to intervene in that call anyway, um, just as a, as a sort of practical and technical matter, the way that um, trust and safety and Zoom works. In terms of the question as to whether Layla Khaled could be a customer, you know, Zoom follows uh, U.S. law in terms of um, uh, in terms of who can obtain its services. Um, and so, if she is a uh, she herself is not, I don't want to give her legal advice or anybody else legal advice, but like the argument would be, is she herself an, an SDN? Is she sanctioned by the U.S. government, um, the uh, uh, Department of Commerce, the Department of State? Um, Department of Treasury, um, such that we were not legally permitted to allow her to use the, use the services, in which case, like, we do have, um, a, you know, a screening process you know, for new customers based on the information we have available to us, which is somewhat limited. And if somebody is prohibited from using Zoom services based on the law, then they wouldn't be able to use the service. That's a whole different analysis, right? If she's not herself an SDN, she's not, um, she could theoretically get on a call and, and call Sean. Uh, a Zoom call and call Sean, right? Like, um, but the public nature of the event in that it can be used as a sort of a public facing platform for X um, does again, back to our initial point, change the dynamics of it. So you're saying that the community standards apply to public Zoom events? Well, so <laughs> with the caveat that again, like what happens in this meeting, if with, um, with in this meeting, say it's just the six of us uh, and we're not, putting out content be behind us and some uninvited participant comes in, somebody you all don't know, did not invite, but they got the meeting credentials because somebody tweeted it out. And they, uh, you know, drew swastikas all over our screens. You would typically report that to Zoom with the expectation that Zoom would do something with respect to the uninvited participant. Right. And so in that context, we would take action, uh, assuming we had sufficient evidence that that thing actually happened and we do so on the basis of our community standards that prohibit hate in this context. Got it. So we have another question. Uh, wondering about LGBTQ plus rights freedoms efforts happening globally, how criminalized groups abroad may use Zoom to organize in violation of local law. 
I think this pertains to some of the issues that, that uh, Kate was discussing a little bit earlier. Somebody like yes. this? So, Kate, please. Yeah, so this is, this, is, um, this is kind of where you get into some, right now in particular, um, there, I think uh, Ethiopia and Uganda have various, um, like kind of, uh, I actually don't know the specific laws, but generally speaking, there's no, I think homosexuality is illegal and that like you certainly can have depictions of homosexuality on the platforms. And they, um, and it's basically up to places like Facebook to be like, are we going to continue to operate under these draconian immoral rules that like do not comport with like our Western like sense of morality and where the norms have moved maybe even globally around this as a, as a human right? Or are we going to, you know, which is a somewhat imperialist kind of colonialist kind of perspective of like, well, we're going to, we're going to bring our modern sense of knowing what's right to this, to this new place. And, or whether they're going to just say, okay, let's hand over the keys to uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, like the government, and they have made this illegal. So we're going to block it, um, all types of content that are reported to us. And we're going to block them within the boundaries of like that country. And I think that the, those are really hard questions that these platforms are, are, are grappling with right now. And so far, and until recently, I think that like in the, it, it, this was actually easier um, before people understood how much power these platforms had to control all of this stuff. I would say like, like in the early 2000s into kind of 2015, that was like the heyday of like kind of a very Europe, um, American expansionist kind of policy through the community standards that were very kind of uh, very strong free speech balanced um, and kind of going everywhere that Facebook went or Twitter went. And so I think that there is, um, I think that these are really hard questions and I don't know what you're going to do. It's, and it gets again down to whether or not, you know, Zoom, continues to maintain itself as one brand, you could see Zoom also breaking off and becoming Zoom telephone. And then it's only like a limit of like only five people and only private can't be distributed. And then if you want to distribute a service, there's a separate set of rules and that's like Zoom classroom. And then you have a Zoom lecture or something. And these all create different uses or Zoom movie or something like that. And that these create different kind of use structures and different types of kind of uh, the level of publicity, the staying power, of the of the material of the content that's created like whether it's recorded or whether it's it's um, broadcast simultaneously uh like we're doing now and so i think that all of those things are ways that we're going to eventually sort out some of these questions um but there's just not a one size fits all for for any of these things and there's no one set of as you know we just have no one set of norms also unfortunately no one set of like morals around how other countries are going to govern um, I, I think just one brief remark, and then I want to put, put something out for comments. Um, on the issue of academic freedom and its international stature, I think things are a little different because we are all faculty members, regardless of where our university is located, and we believe in the same levels of professional standards for scholarship. So, you know, we don't care where our colleagues, where their university is, we respect and demand the same standards of quality uh, be met uh, for their research and for their teaching. We trust that they've taught their students to an appropriate standard. So I do think that academic freedom is something which we have an international expectation of, understanding that in many different places in the world, the political and social and cultural infrastructure might not be very strong to support it, um, and that creates its own set of issues. But I don't think it's a matter of just local attitude about academic freedom. I think academic freedom is something which is universal um, and which applies in virtue of being a faculty member regardless of where you are. Uh, so I think I just wanna put that out there as, as a, a slightly different perspective, at least on that kind of issue. The other question I have, and I'd like to hear people's opinions um, is that the other thing that of course dramatically happened, which we weren't expecting with the pandemic, was the shift of classroom content to Zoom. 
uh, previously in online courses, you know, either they were just like a glorified TED talk or something which universities would standardly host on their own servers. But now we have complete classroom structure being undertaken online. And of course, this has raised the interest of administrators, regents, trustees, et cetera, in expanding the reach of education and degree granting programs into the online dimension. Uh, almost, you know, having exclusively, for example, online degrees is something under active discussion at UC, for sure, and I'm sure at many other universities. Um, so now the question becomes, with the Leila Khaled case, it was, I think, clear that if Sean had been presenting exactly the material that she would have been discussing, that would not have been problematic um, in the presentation. It wouldn't have been grounds for denial of service. The fact that it was that person doing it uh, was what was significant. Um, but when we move to a greater online presence of classrooms, content will become the issue. And there will be people who will object to that. So for example, we'll, you know, if we have classrooms about critical race theory in the current today, what's going on today, we might expect to hear loud objections to having you know, online courses on critical race theory. Why isn't that being stopped? Why is Zoom allowing that? Um, so I think that these are somewhat different. I mean, they relate to obviously uh, lectures and things, but I'd like to away a little bit from you know, protection of content, because that's really what about academic freedom is about. It's about protection of academic content and the ability of faculty to present that content uh, in a completely free manner. Um, so I want to put that to see what people's, uh, you know, out there for the commentary. So, you know, that's, that, that's bringing us to, again, this line between whether the class is a closed community or whether uh, we're, it's something that's being broadcast uh, more broadly. Uh, and Kate was making that series of distinctions. Uh, and I just wanted to note that in the negotiations over this policy, uh, there was a point at which a distinction had been proposed between uh, events that just involved uh, community members so if I was, if we were hosting something that only UC people could attend versus uh, events like this, which anybody with the link can join. And we pushed back quite hard on that. And I was quite happy that that distinction didn't make it into the ultimate policy because it seemed in tension with the public dissemination of knowledge uh, element of the university's mission and of academic freedom. And so there was a concern that uh, if all we got was content content control over things within our closed circle, that that wouldn't be sufficient uh, for, for what we were seeking. And so, although I do see Kate's point about how we might treat these, how it might make sense to treat these differently, I think going to uh, Professor May's point, you know, it's, it's important for us to be protecting the ways in which the university is outward facing and that scholarship is outward facing and that student events are outward facing. And one of the things I'm very curious to see going forward is to what extent our most controversial speeches, uh, talks will end up going online. Uh, you know, if you think of the big student controversies at, the, at UC and elsewhere in recent years, it's the student invited controversial speakers uh, and in the cases when those talks have been shut down on my campus at Davis, at Berkeley uh, and elsewhere, it's been not because an administrator has said, we don't like this content. It's been because we were getting into hundreds of thousands of dollars of police protection in order to allow those events to proceed. So I'll be curious going forward to what extent the alternative of, sure, you can have controversial speaker X, uh, but, it's got to be on Zoom because we're not paying another five hundred thousand dollars to get off-duty police on on campus to protect uh, to allow this speech to go on. So I could actually imagine a world in which the most controversial speech is being uh, put onto Zoom and then being given a much larger uh, a much larger audience as a as a result. Yeah, 
Brian, I just want to say that I completely agree with you. I think that that's what's 100% is what's going to happen. I think that the role that universities were, I think that one of the interesting things that you kind of flesh out here, or like their point fleshes out is the idea that uh, what is the role that universities play in academic freedom? It is to some extent a complete, uh, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of the dirty little secret of academic freedom is that it's not that free in terms of like if you're not in the university and you say that you want to have public facing events well, what would you do for public facing events before zoom you would have you know there would be certain people that would come in and you would have security for, for any event like you would have and there would be people who are agitators who would protest against it who would be like against those things but it was limited because it was confined by like the meat space of like physical space right you couldn't amplify and you also couldn't amplify your event like on your own if you were a small student group the the what student groups get out of universities is amplification and a bit and clout and an ability to invite speakers in because they're situated in this university setting so if you can be like like the lgdp like the baylor university lgbtq community and you want to have a very controversial speak speaker come speak at your university why would you even bother to ask the university at all like you can completely host the event absent the university involvement and and i and like so i think that that's exactly what's going to happen um and i and i think that i don't know whether that's good or bad for academic freedom Reminds me of uh, when I was dean, I wanted to ask the Pope to come to speak at the law school. So I talked to the Vatican about security, it was a million dollars. <laughs> no, <laughs> a good idea at the time. So, I, you know, it's certainly true what you're saying, um, Brian, but I think the implication of what Kate is saying is that um, it's going to become increasingly unclear what is a university event and what isn't. Because if you have a student group that's putting it on, but they don't need university endorsement or resources or support or maintenance. What makes it a university event? You know, it could be, uh, this becomes now a much more unclear thing. Um, and uh, so I think part of what's gonna happen with this is that uh, where uh, the, the university already had outward boundaries by giving its resources on a first come first serve kind of public forum basis to student groups without content control, which was, it had to have been in the end justified by educational reasoning, but it was never clear exactly what that reasoning was. Now with Zoom, you don't need the resources. So you have the groups. So when is it university? When isn't it? And that and then feeds back on this question of when is it academic freedom and when is it just plain old freedom of speech? We're going to be back to that question. And on the first point you made, Robert, you know, I just joined this group called the Global Observatory of Academic Freedom. You know, it's international experts on academic all over the world. And let me just say, it's not so universal. I mean, very different in different countries. It's, we, have, we tend to have in the United States a very coherent, integrated concept of academic freedom because we've had since 1915, the decisions of the Committee A of AUP, which is given content to and is enshrined in the 40 statement, et cetera, et cetera. Other countries don't have that. They have uh, histories of state control and what it means in different countries is radically different. That's what I'm uh, I certainly understand. And even within the scholarly discussion, as you well know, there are a variety of different opinions about what academic freedom means, including those who think the AUP position is just not the right position. Um, but um, again, uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll let that, that pass. <laughs> um, great, well, um, I think we're just about out of time. Uh, I'd like to, we have two more minutes, if anyone would like to have a, a closing statement here. Um, I do think that, that the point that's just been brought up is an important one, uh, but I'd like to turn it around that there will be decisions to be made whether we, when we can use Zoom, for example, and online platforms, um, whether an event is a university event or not. But what's the advantage to us of having it as a university event. That is, it should be things that are provided to us by making it an academic event. And presumably those would pertain to academic freedom protections, which we receive by making it under the aegis of the university and its academic freedom policies as opposed to not. So I think it's not simply we want to opt out of restrictions that we may be placed under by making it a university event but may want to opt in because there will be benefits to being a university event. Uh, and so 
I think that's sort of, you know, an interesting balance going forward to the kind of decision making. So in the last minute or two, uh, we have we have just enough time for parting shots if anyone would like to, to make one before we we wrap up. I, I'd like to jump in and maybe circle back around to the to the event that, that started this, right? Um, you know, there are a lot of really interesting abstract issues we've talked about today with technology and academic freedom and free enterprise and the law and the university. Um, but I don't want to lose sight of the particular issue of Palestine and, and how that intersects with these issues, because I, I don't think it's a coincidence that many of these academic freedom issues arise around the question of Palestine, whether it's Leila Khaled, whether it's the Irvine 11, whether it's Stephen Salida at UIUC, um, whether it's about class content. And I know, you know, Robert Post was involved at least tangentially in one of these controversies at Berkeley in the early 2000s about, uh, about the, you know, the Intifada curriculum and, you know, English 1A. Um, and, you know, the thing is these rights, these rights based discourses that we talk about, um, you know, whatever we think of them philosophically, they can never be abstracted away from the structures of power and ideology in which they exist and function. Um, and in this particular case, the structures of power in this country, including university administrations, have been reflexively and strongly pro-Israel for a very, very long time. Um, you know, we could have a whole seminar on the reasons for that, but I don't think there's much debating that this country has a hugely pro-Israel tilt, and that impacts discussions around nominally abstract issues like economic freedom when it comes to Palestine. And that very much played out in the case of my event. Um, my, my local administration was nominally supportive. They're like, okay, we'll talk to Zoom legal, yada, yada, yada. yada. Um, but on April 20th, uh, three days before my, our event was supposed to happen, and ironically the same day I got the denial of service from Zoom, um, a campus-wide email went out suddenly announcing that our Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion was sponsoring an event entitled Anti-Semitism and Our Principles of Community that was scheduled for exactly the same day and time as our event on Palestine. Uh, and the description of that event, when you click to register for it, said counter-programming, this is a direct quote, counter-programming is a vital tool in addressing speech that can be harmful. So even before our event had happened, um, an event that actually featured two prominent anti-Zionist Jews, the university had determined that a discussion about free speech and Palestine was so potentially harmful and anti-Semitic that it required the administration, you know, not individual faculty or students, this is not a faculty event, this is not a student event, but the university administration proactively mobilized counter-programming to protect our community. Um, I think we need to absolutely say this was not a violation of academic freedom. This was the classic case of meeting so-called bad speech, right, in this case, pro-Palestine speech, with, you know, good speech. Uh, but I think this brings us back to this issue of framework to power, right, because you know, I've now, I'm just finishing my 16th year at the University of California, Merced. Um, I was a member of the founding faculty, and I've been involved in the political life of the campus from the beginning. And I can't recall a single other instance where the university felt compelled to proactively mount counter-programming to an event before it had even happened. Uh, and, of course, the great irony here is that our event on Palestine didn't go forward. It wasn't carried. Uh, an event that my co-writers co and I had worked and sweated over for months, ultimately we couldn't do publicly because the university couldn't find us an alternative to Zoom. Um, but the university did organize and go ahead with the counter-programming to an event that never actually happened. Um, and of course, you know, no rights were violated here, right? There's no violation of my academic freedom or of anyone else's academic freedom. But I think it's a telling indication of the kind of institutional priorities and the power at play here that my university was more willing to go to bat to defend an apartheid state from potential criticism than it was to protect the rights of its faculty members to present educational content when it comes to Palestine. Uh, and that for me highlights some of the kind of limits of academic freedom as a, as a larger concept, regardless of the technology or regardless of who's making those decisions. Well, I need to wrap things up. Uh, the topics that have been discussed today uh, will be continue to be discussed. Um, and I want to thank all of our panelists. It was extremely enlightening. Uh, and um, I know we'll be, this will be on YouTube. Uh, so there will be many viewers going forward as we continue these extremely important conversations. So thank you all and have a very pleasant afternoon.